The next item of business is a statement by Rosanna Cunningham on Scotland's contribution to international action on climate change and the Paris Agreement. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of her statement and there should be no interventions or interruptions. I call on Rosanna Cunningham. Around 10 minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'll begin with a short formal statement on our annual progress as required by the Climate Change Act. On 31st October, I laid before this Parliament a statutory report on the status of the latest annual target under the 2009 Act. The report shows the annual target and domestic effort target for 2014 were both met. The report reflects emission statistics published in June showing progress so strong that Scotland exceeded the level of its world-leading 2020 target of a 42% cut six years early. Scotland's emissions in 2014 were 45.8% lower than in 1990. By any standards, this is an excellent performance. On a comparable basis, Scotland is among the top performers in the EU 15 countries, second only to Sweden since 1990. And while visiting Scotland in March, Christiana Figueres, the outgoing head of the UNFCCC, called Scotland's actions exemplary. Lord Deben, chair of the Committee on Climate Change, has said the Scottish Government's policies and programmes have made a significant difference. You are meeting a target, and the target is tough. Building on Scotland's outstanding progress and recognising that the Paris Agreement, to which I'll return in a moment, represents a call to action for all countries, we have committed to outlining proposals for a new climate change bill, including a new and more testing emissions reduction target for 2020. Our approach to setting the levels of future statutory targets will continue to be based on best evidence, including the independent expert advice of the Committee on Climate Change on the implications of the Paris Agreement for Scotland. We will be consulting on the bill based on the Committee's advice early next year. While we now anticipate new legislation, the Scottish Government remains committed to discharging the requirements of the 2009 Act in a manner that is both evidence-based and high in ambition. In particular, my ministerial colleagues and I are working together in the Cabinet Subcommittee on Climate Change to agree the package of policies and proposals for our climate change plan. The plan will set out policies and proposals to deliver Scotland's statutory emission reduction targets out to 2032 under the 2009 Act. As requested by the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee, we will bring a draft of the plan for parliamentary scrutiny in January. Presiding officer, that is the uh, initial formal statement I'm required to make to Parliament, but I do now want to follow that formal statement to talk a little more about the new international context represented by the historic Paris Agreement. Uh, the Paris Agreement is the first truly global action plan to tackle climate change. The 196 countries of the UN Climate Convention have agreed that, in the words of the treaty, climate change represents an urgent and potentially irreversible threat to human societies and the planet and requires the widest possible cooperation by all countries. The agreed international aim is to limit global temperature rise to well below 2 degrees C and pursue efforts to limit it to 1.5 degrees C with rapid reductions in emissions to net zero in the second half of this century. The Paris Agreement was the first big challenge for the UN Sustainable Development Framework the international set of goals to fight poverty and transform the world economy. In July 2015, the First Minister announced that the Scottish Government would adopt the Sustainable Development Framework, making Scotland one of the first nations to commit to the goals. The Paris Agreement followed calls from the G7 leaders of industrialised countries for urgent and concrete action, deep cuts in emissions and decarbonisation of the global economy this century. There have, of course, also been strong calls for action from world faith leaders. Indeed, I'd like to draw members' attention to the global interfaith message issued today to the UN Climate Conference in Marrakesh, which has been signed by Scottish faith leaders. Tackling major global issues like climate change usually requires leadership from the USA. EU climate diplomacy kept the UNFCCC process moving forward during the years following the Copenhagen summit, but it was the partnership between the USA and China in 2014 which finally enabled a level of ambition at Paris that was at the very top end of expectations. 
The US presidential election this week undoubtedly means a tougher job for progressive US states, so it makes it all the more important to promote very strongly the economic case for action on climate change, the massive investment and future jobs that will flow from the low carbon transition. So how is Scotland contributing to the international agenda? We have significantly scaled up renewable electricity capacity and in 2015 it accounted for 56.7% of Scotland's gross electricity consumption. Scaling up existing technologies is very important in the international context. Delivering a 45.8% cut in emissions and exceeding our 2020 target level six years early shows other countries that deep emissions cuts are possible. We also delivered our 2020 target of 500 megawatts of community and locally owned renewables five years ahead of schedule. And incidentally, we've set new and more testing targets of one gigawatt by 2020 and two gigawatts by 2030. We've also achieved a 15.2% cut in total energy consumption, passing our 2020 target of 12% six years early. We've contributed to achievements at the European level where the EU is currently ahead of schedule with a 24% cut in emissions against the 20% target for 2020. Based on Scottish and EU experience, progress will likely be faster than we expect. And this is important because the existing pledges under the Paris Agreement are only enough to limit global temperature rise to perhaps around three degrees. It is clear that more will need to be done. Scotland and the EU have also both been cutting emissions while growing the economy. And that's, as I said, a very important international message now. Low carbon and renewable energy employ over 21,000 people in Scotland. Laurent Fabius, the French minister who presided over the success at Paris, spoke at Edinburgh Castle in September. He emphasised the huge support from devolved region and state governments, local government, cities, businesses, NGOs, faith groups, trade unions and civic society that helped make the Paris Agreement. This echoes the Scottish experience of strong cross-party and cross-society support for climate action. So we believe non-state actors will help drive a strongly progressive agenda faster than expected. The Climate Group brings together governments and businesses on the international stage to promote high ambition. Scotland has been a very active member of the Climate Group States and Regions Alliance for over a decade. It has provided an excellent platform for Scottish ministers to get our important messages across. We've also signed the Under 2 MOU, a huge coalition setting targets for 2050 and now representing over 800 million people. Importantly, we also now report annually on our progress directly to the international community under the Compact of States and Regions. Scotland is also continuing to champion climate justice because the worst impacts of climate change are falling on the poor and vulnerable. Following this, Parliament's debate on climate justice in 2012 and Scotland's International Climate Justice Conference in October 2013, the Scottish National Action Plan on Human Rights commits us to continue to champion climate justice. Scotland's Innovative Climate Justice Fund, initially supported by £6 million from our hydronation programme, has supported 11 projects in Malawi, Zambia, Tanzania and Rwanda by Scottish Catholic International Aid Fund, Voluntary Service Overseas, Tier Fund, University of Strathclyde, Glasgow Caledonian University, Oxfam Scotland, Christian Aid Scotland and Water Witness International. And the First Minister announced £3 million annually will now be invested by Scotland and that will be over the next five years. We've already announced in March £2 million from Hydronation to help improve more lives in Malawi through the University of Strathclyde's Water Futures programme. The fund has provided additional support to the humanitarian crisis in Malawi uh, with £240,000 last month on a match funding basis to Oxfam, Christian Aid, SCAF and EMS International doubling the Scottish Government contribution, which is helping supply at least 35,000 people uh, with basic food supplies over the coming uh, months. In a further diversi uh, diversification of the fund's activities, the First Minister announced a £1 million contribution uh, to the Capacity Building Initiative for Transparency, an important foundation for the success of the Paris Agreement, supporting developing countries' engagement with the Treaty. And while the worst impacts of climate change will fall on developing countries and areas like the Arctic, we needn't forget that Scotland, uh, we needn't assume that Scotland will be immune. An independent assessment of Scotland's adaptation programme in 2016 highlighted the good start we've made on our adaptation programme, but cautioned uh, on the challenges ahead. Peatland restoration is a valuable investment in terms of climate adaptation, reducing emissions from degraded areas and creating carbon sequestration opportunities. 
It provides significant co-benefits such as biodiversity, water quality and natural flood management. And I expect these to be recognised in the forthcoming climate change plan. Uh, I can confirm today that we've made available £400,000 to SNH to bring forward further action uh, this coming financial year. To return to the Paris Agreement, I attended the Extraordinary Environment Council in Brussels on 30th September to lend Scotland's uh, very strong support for early ratification uh, by the EU. And we were delighted uh, last week to welcome the coming into force of the agreement four years early on the 4th of November. Uh, the EU, which currently pledges at least 40% emissions cuts by 2030, is working to deliver that pledge. And the EU has committed to play a full part in the mechanisms under the Paris Agreement designed to raise global ambition over time. In conclusion, we've cut our emissions by 45.8% between 1990 and 2014, meeting our 2014 annual target and exceeding our 2020 target of a 42% cut six years early. We will continue to rise to the challenge. In 2017, we will publish a new energy strategy, fully integrated with a new climate change plan and a new climate change bill, establishing a new and more testing 2020 target. Other countries must now match Scotland's ambitions and actions. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in her statement, and I intend to allow around 20 minutes for that. Um, it would be helpful if members who wish to ask a question could press the request to speak buttons now, and I call Maurice Golden. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance copy of her statement. First of all, can I note that we welcome the ratification of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change and encourage all UN member states to do all they can to deliver under the obligations contained in the agreement. Here in Scotland, the Scottish Government has overseen the establishment of ambitious climate change targets, and the good news is that emissions in Scotland are now 46% lower than in 1990 uh, after failing to meet their targets in the preceding four years. Emission reductions and leaderships need to be shown in other sectors which have lagged behind, such as transport, heat and energy efficiency. For example, transport emissions have decreased by less than 1% in comparison to the 1990 baseline. As we continue our transition towards a low-carbon economy, the key will be to have a range of secure and balanced energy sources combined with the ecological and technological solutions that will drive down emissions and enhance carbon sequestration. However, the infrastructure, both natural and physical, has to be put in place today in order to achieve this. Does the Cabinet Sec Secretary agree that sector-specific targets are key to ensuring carbon emissions in sectors such as transport uh, ensure that they contribute to our climate change targets? And will she include these targets in the upcoming climate change plan? Rosanna Cunningham. Um, Presiding officer, can I welcome uh, the support of the Conservatives for the uh, overall uh, approach that we're taking in terms of climate change. I know that that support is replicated across the chamber and I think it's one of the strengths uh, that we have in Scotland that we do uh, have, that, uh, uh, have that support. Um, uh, the, uh, the member raised specifically uh, an issue about transport and while I don't uh, want to get drawn too much into that, um, I, I think what he was playing it forward to is a question about the uh, uh, sector specific targets. Um, at the moment, we haven't uh, uh, made a final decision about what will be in the bill and how it will be uh, constructed. I would uh, caution, however, uh, an assumption that sector-specific targets um, are an easy answer to this because, uh, first of all, we need to make sure that we get the balance right across all sectors in the economy. Uh, and we are, uh, you know, we are able to do that by not actually having the very sector-specific targets. But also, in some cases, Frankly, from my perspective, it would be very difficult to allocate uh, some of the savings to specific, uh, uh, to specific sectors. And I'll give one very small example. Uh, if we go down the road the EU wishes us to go down, uh, as I understand it, in 2019, and every new build home, for example, would have an electric vehicle charging point as standard, does that count for transport or does it count for housing? Or do we have to find some mechanism to allocate uh, between the two. So there are, there, are some, there are some things that then, you know, uh, uh, would look cross-sectoral. How does one then deal with sector-specific targets in those circumstances? Um, uh, so, you know, we will look at all possible approaches, but we will work out what the best is for Scotland 
uh, and we will be consulting that on that in the bill. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, President. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for prior sight of the statement. Scotland is indeed a world leader in tackling climate change and addressing climate justice. There are, of course, continuing challenges, and the need to tackle these must be squarely addressed by the Scottish gov Government in the heaviest emitting sectors, bringing new opportunities and jobs. However, today I want to focus on the global perspective in view of US President-elect Trump's utter denial of the irrefutable climate science and evidence. From whole US states threatened with intolerable temperatures to small island states threatened with annihilation if temperatures are not held below two degrees. Reassuringly, China's central uh, national uh, center for climate change has stated that its climate policy is not dependent on the US presidency. At this critical time for the future of our planet, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if she agrees with me that building confidence and connections between countries and regions will be key in maintaining momentum and action? And may we wish her well in Marrakesh from the Scottish Labour benches in continuing to contribute to this essential process for the future of humanity? Rosanna Cunningham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I uh, thank Claudia Beamish as well for the, uh, uh, the Labour Party's support for the, um, uh, for the climate change uh, policy. Um, I, I hear what she says about some of the sectors that we understand and accept need to be focused on, um, and, and that is something that is an active discussion. Um, and uh, I hope um, that uh, uh, other parties in the chamber um, will respond well to the draft climate change plan when it is published um, and to the new bill when it comes. Um, the member's main uh, concern is about the international scenario at the moment, and I, I think that obviously is a concern for everybody uh, just now. Um, I, I suppose, you know, if I was to try and be as generous as possible, I would say that we, all of us, sometimes during campaigns, hear rhetoric which uh, might not always be um, as fortunate as it could. Um, so we will have to see what happens um, because climate change is happening and the issue isn't going to go away. Um, and uh, uh, America will be subject to the, uh, uh, the damaging effects of climate change regardless uh, of what the leadership might or might not think about it or, or do. Um, I understand that the EU Climate Commissioner Miguel uh, Cañete wrote to Mr Trump yesterday uh, stressing the need for continued EU-US uh, cooperation. Um, Scotland has had a long relationship with the US and we do value that relationship. The Paris Agreement is supported by strong action from states, cities, businesses, faith groups, uh, and so a progressive agenda can still be driven uh, at these levels. Um, we've been through periods before, presiding officer, where US leadership and climate change was uh, absent. But there are huge jobs, investment and growth opportunities from the low-carbon economy and the innovation required for the low-carbon transition. And the US could benefit from that low-carbon economy as well. So I think we would try to approach this with, with as much optimism as possible uh, in the circumstances. I call Graham Day to be followed by Edward Mountain. I uh, thank you. Uh, whilst recognising and welcoming progress made to date, if we are to respond to call, the call to action of the Paris Agreement, we will need to secure very significant behavioural change across society. The UK CCC have recently appointed a behavioural scientist, and its chair, Lord Debon, has suggested this is an area the Scottish Government ought to explore more closely. Is this something the Cabinet Secretary is already taking forward, or would be prepared to consider? Rosanna Cunningham. Yes, um, I think we would all agree with uh, Graham Day that influencing behaviours is one of the keys to delivering our climate change targets. And this is something we're keen to work with the UK Committee on Climate Change on. Um, we are already looking at how we can strengthen the behavioural aspects of our climate change policies. For example, the Individual Social and Material Tool, ISM for short, helps policy areas break down the factors that influence people's behaviours. And we are using the tool across a range of policy areas, including housing and energy. Uh, and last year, officials gave a presentation to the UK CCC uh, on our behaviours work. So we are conscious and aware of the challenge. Um, uh, we do think we've got some uh, uh, useful work that will help that. Um, and uh, a summary of that work will accompany the draft climate change plan. And I know that the 
uh, the member will uh, welcome that. Edward Mountain to be followed by Angus Macdonald. I too would like to thank the Cabinet Secretary for sight of her statement before uh, earlier. Professor Robin Matthews of the Hutton Institute suggested restoring 21,000 hectares of peatland annually would contribute to an 8% reduction in the Scottish carbon emissions. The Minister has announced, and I welcome it, expenditure of 400,000 in this coming year, which, however, on previous performance will deliver, deliver less than 15% of this target. My question is, is the government being ambitious enough in peatland restoration, much of which is in the, the area which I represent, region I represent? <laughs> Rosanna um, Cunningham. Uh, I thank Ed Mighton for his question. Um, yes, I think this is one of the general areas which we accept as a challenge for us um, and that we need to do more in, and it is one of the areas in which, which we are looking at uh, very closely. The peatland plan recognises the multiple benefits of peatlands and the linkages with a number of policy drivers, such as biodiversity as well as climate change. Um, and, and some of these policies do already include a target for restoration. Um, uh, the, the member may be aware of the biodiversity uh, route map uh, contribute to the EU 15% restoration target and we're looking at peatlands in the context of the forthcoming climate change action plan so it is a, it is a serious issue. Um, through the SNH led peatland action over 5,000 hectares were restored in 2014-15 and almost 4,000 in 2015-16 but I would be the first to agree that that has to be increased uh, substantially. Um, of course not all, uh, I mean Many of the peatland areas are in private ownership and uh, I hope the member won't take it amiss if I suggest gently that uh, private landowners uh, uh, must also think about some of the actions that they can take uh, as well. Thank you. Angus MacDonald, followed by Richard Leonard. Thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the need for the UK to have a National Determined Contribution, or NDC, under the Paris Agreement. The EU member states opted to implement jointly their commitments under the climate treaties. Therefore, uh, given the complexity of the issue, the EU submitted an NDC to cover the period 2020 to 25 on behalf of all EU member states. However, as a result of Brexit, the UK will now have to complete its own NDC and it needs to be done soon. Does the Cabinet Secretary share my concern that the UK Government will not have the capacity to complete its own NDC in time? And can I ask her to raise the issue with her UK counterpart while she is in Marrakesh? Rosanna Cunningham. Thank you. Uh, officer, with your permission, I'll remain standing for the remainder of this. I'm having a slight problem with my back and getting yes, up and that's down fine. is causing a difficulty. Um, if I could respond to um, Angus MacDonald's question, um, I, I, I appreciate his interest in this, but it perhaps is just a little far down the road for us to be able to uh, deal with at the moment. Um, obviously, uh, COP22 is currently underway in Marrakesh, um, and uh, I will be part of the uh, UK representation there, as will uh, colleagues from uh, Westminster. Um, uh, the UK is a party to the UNFCCC individually, as well as through the EU, uh, and will be bound by all the obligations of the agreement under international law. Um, the UK stresses that it does remain committed to international efforts to tackle climate change, and at the present, uh, uh, at any level, we are uh, continuing to be a member of the EU, so existing rules uh, do apply. Um, I understand that Norway and Iceland have both submitted uh, INDCs to the Paris Agreement, although they'll deliver their commitment through a collective delivery with the EU and its member states, and the EU NDC cover period, uh, covers a period to 2030. So we're perhaps just a little premature in trying to have that conversation at the moment, uh, but it is one that people know has to be had. <laughs> Richard Leonard, followed by Mark Ruskell. Uh, thanks, Deputy Presiding Officer. In her statement, the Cabinet Secretary said that 21,000 people are employed in low carbon uh, and renewable energy in Scotland. Uh, this is very welcome. But does she agree with me that with a long-term plan for the economy, including planning agreements with renewable energy companies and with an active industrial policy in place from her government, these job numbers could be increased substantially in the future, not least in our indigenous steel industry, our engineering industries and in our manufacturing supply base. Rosanna Cunningham. The things that we are investigating very closely for the climate change plan, um, it, it, is a, it is an issue that is at the forefront of our mind because uh, there are uh, real economic opportunities uh, uh, with 
the advent of uh, tackling climate change. Uh, but equally, we need to look at some of the existing industries to see how they can be recast um, uh, uh, as well. So there is a deal of work being done on that particular basis. Um, uh, there, are, uh, there are aspects of what we are doing already built into the manufacturing strategy so that all of the work that we do on waste in the circular economy um, is embedded throughout the manufacturing strategy. So we're beginning to see that um, going through all of the portfolio areas and that will begin to show uh, the effects and I hope very much uh, the kind of thing that the member and myself and I suspect most people in the chamber would like to see. Sorry, I'm on, I, do I have to instruct you to stay standing, Cabinet Secretary? <laughs> I'm on autopilot, I'm afraid. <laughs> Mark Ruskell, followed by Tavish Scott. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary uh, for advanced copy of our statement and uh, look forward to testing the climate plan uh, when it emerges in, in January. Um, in terms of the international perspective, um, while we now have a climate denier uh, in the White House, hope has not been extinguished across America. Uh, states including New York, California and Colorado have joined with Scotland and regional governments around the world to limit global warming to less than two degrees through the, no, through the under two MOU initiative already mentioned by uh, yourself, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, states representing almost a third of the world's economy. So what specific actions will the Scottish Government be taking with these progressive US states around innovation, research and investment so that whatever chaos emerges from the White House we stay collectively focused on the jobs that will come from tackling climate change. Rosanna Cunningham. I, I, I uh, welcome uh, that question because I think that is uh, you know, one of the key things uh, that uh, um, this uh, Marrakesh opportunity gives us is the ability to immediately make connections uh, along the lines he, uh, he is raising through that uh, uh, MOU, but also through the climate group, which of course brings together um, a wide range of state, what, what might one call sub-state um, uh, NGOs, etc., where a great deal of work can be done. And we mustn't forget that that is where Scotland sits. Scotland, in that sense, however much I might wish it to be other, at the moment sits there with, uh, as an equivalent to the likes of Colorado, etc. So um, I go to Marrakesh on Saturday, um, you know, with the, you know, with the ability to talk about the great success that we have had in Scotland, but I also go to Marrakesh uh, with an open mind in order to learn from others because others will have come up with ideas which I think we may be able to translate to our situation. And I very much hope that I get a, 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 an opportunity to have the kind of engagement which I think is essential going forward. And I very much hope it starts uh, when I arrive in Marrakesh on Saturday. Tavish Scott, you were followed by for Fulton McGregor. Thank you, Sir, Possibly you should invite us all just to sit down and stay sitting down, which would be more helpful to the Cabinet Secretary. Can I thank her too for... Uh, uh, can I thank her too for a copy of the statement? Uh, does she share mine and many other people's concern that the, the President-elect of the United States has actually vowed to cancel the Paris Agreement altogether? Uh, in those circumstances, when she does go to Marrakesh on Saturday, will she, with ministerial colleagues from across the country, uh, use the much-vaunted special relationship to bring pressure on the incoming administration uh, to address exactly that point? And has she also noticed the, I take it, helpful briefing in today's Press and Journal, which in illustrates that the Scottish Government might specifically have a particular route direct to the Scottish Government to raise this and indeed other issues as well. Rosanna um, Cunningham. What I, what I can't say is who from the incoming administration may be in Marrakesh. Um, I would have anticipated there will be a number of people from the current administration, but of course it's the current administration that has signed up to the Paris Agreement. Um, I am conscious of some of the things that the President-elect has said uh, in respect of climate change. Uh, it's not just about the denial, it's about his intention to cut federal funding for climate change activity, uh, um, his intention to restart a coal industry, um, uh, to, uh, uh, and you know, he has already, in a sense, signalled with some of the early uh, appointments that he might make that this may be a challenge, but as I indicated before, I think we have to try and be as optimistic as possible and keep in mind that people will suffer the impact of climate change regardless of what their uh, uh, leadership may or may not uh, believe in. 
Um, it, it, is, it is going to be a significant concern for considerable parts of the United States of America, as it is for every other part of the world. And uh, sooner or later, I think that will have to be dealt with. I also understand um, that it may not be quite so straightforward to now uh, reverse ferret out of the Paris Agreement as uh, might otherwise be thought. It may take three or four years. So let's hope in that three or four years, we can all of us, in every way we have available to us, uh, effect change in the administration's views. Uh, can I say, I, I, we've had quite long questions and answers, and I am able to, to give a little bit extra Shorten. time, okay. because I'm very keen to get everyone in. But if we could be a, a little shorter in questions and answers, and if you could please remain on your feet, Ms Cunningham. Fulton McGregor to be followed by Alexander Burnett. Thank you, President Officer. Tackling climate change is a major challenge which requires effort by each and every one of us. The Cabinet Secretary's leadership is hugely valuable, but does she agree with me that every minister in our government and indeed every MSP in this chamber should see themselves as a climate champion, climate change champion? Rosanna Cunningham. Oh, yes. <laughs> I think we all have our uh, part to play in this. And that's not just ministers, that's every MSP, indeed every household. Um, and I, I can give the Chamber this assurance that uh, my colleagues are united in their determination to ensure that Scotland's record on climate change does continue to set an example for the rest of the UK. Um, we do take our responsibilities very seriously indeed, um, and they hear from me on this uh, fairly frequently. It is a big challenge, and there is a huge challenge in some sectors, and there's no point us pretending that it's not challenging. Some of, these, uh, some of the things that we need to do are not easy, and they're not going to be easy. Um, but our goal is to cut emissions while building a successful low-carbon economy. Um, and that's back to the comments that Richard Leonard made, one which generates jobs, increases prosperity, and, of course, improves health and makes Scotland a cleaner, greener place to live. And these conversations are had not just at the subcommittee on climate change level, but also at an informal level as well. Oh, yes, would have been enough, Cabinet Secretary. Sorry? I said, oh, yes, would have been enough. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> Alexander Burnett, followed by Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Officer, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance notice of her statement. Uh, as you will be aware, the National Performance Framework outcomes are targets that the Scottish Government aspires to meet. And outcome 14 states that the Scottish Government will reduce the local and global environmental impact of our consumption and production. So can I ask, how does the Cabinet Secretary square this with importing frac gas from America and the additional carbon cost that this incurs? Rosanna Cunningham. Well, Mr Burnett is nothing if not persistent on this particular issue, but I think I answered him yesterday on this. Uh, was, it, was it a... Sorry? <laughs> I, I, I think I kind of uh, 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 talked about this yesterday. Um, the, 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 uh, uh, the Energy Minister has made very clear what we are doing in respect of this. He has laid out the plan for the uh, future. The energy strategy will be published alongside the climate change plan on, in January. Um, and uh, I, I think that we have been absolutely crystal clear on our approach on this. And I hope the member will accept that that is what is going to happen. Snappy questions and answers, please. Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Mark Griffin. Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary recall hearing a long line of assurances to our island communities about the future of remote onshore island wind? A rather odd description. Um, yesterday was a highly suspicious day for announcing they were reneging on these promises, hoping it to be buried by other news. Uh, should we now make sure that we make common cause with Maurice Golden, who said infrastructure needs to be put in place, uh, and others of progressive nature on climate change in this parliament to get that decision overturned? Rosanna Cunningham. Well, I would certainly welcome support across the chamber, including from the Conservatives on this. Uh, that was a long-awaited announcement, and it was very disappointing on a number of fronts. Um, I'm not quite sure what the timing was all about. I'll let others draw their own conclusions on that. We have repeatedly sought assurances from UK ministers. Um, it's a matter of regret that this government was not consulted before the announcement. That is unfortunate um, because our islands have huge renewable energy potential, possibly the best in the whole of Europe. Mark Griffin to be followed by Claire Hockey. Thank you, President Officer. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary how the government supports families living in fuel poverty to 
reduce their consumption, reduce their carbon emissions, reduce the cost of their fuel bills, since that without uh, government support and intervention, it's unlikely that we'd ever see these um, emission savings realised. Rosanna Cunningham. Uh, one of the things that we will be doing through the energy efficiency programme is uh, um, going to be designed to try and support people through uh, that whole process um, with the intention, ideally, of dealing both with the emissions side of is the issue and the fuel poverty side of the issue. So um, the work that is, uh, uh, that is committed uh, uh, in, in that particular programme uh, will include uh, support for households and I hope that the member uh, will welcome that and welcome the considerable financial commitment that is going to be made over the term of this parliament in that particular area. And the last quick question please Claire Hawkey. Thank you presiding officer. Does the cabinet secretary share my view that recent events at home and abroad underline the need for concerted international cooperation in the fight against climate change? Rosanna Cunningham. I'm not sure there's very much I can add to what I've already said in this particular area. I mean, obviously 2016 has just been one of those years. There's been seismic political change uh, uh, here in the UK um, and now in the United States. But as I've indicated before, politics may change, but the science hasn't. Politics may change, but the impact of climate change won't. And the need for concerted global action is just as great now as it was before. That concludes the statement and question session. And we will move on to the next item of business, if people could uh, change their seats accordingly.